Hello, in this video, we're going to talk about non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, also known as NSAIDs. This is a pharmacology video. Now, NSAIDs are very common drugs used by the public, uh, it is used uh, specifically for pain. So, in order to understand its mechanism of action, we need to revise some basic neurology, um, specifically the pain pathway. So, here we have a section of the cortex. Um, where sensation is perceived, called the somatosensory cortex. And again, this is a section of the brain where sensation is perceived. So when you feel pressure against your skin or when you feel pain on your arm, those sensation are felt in this part of the brain. And so the somatosensory cortex can be further divided into areas representing different parts of your body, your limbs. So we'll talk about that later on. Now, the brain connects to the brainstem, which is made up of three important parts. These are the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. These are only sections of the main uh, of those parts of the brainstem. The brainstem continues on and forms the spinal cord. Here, I'm only drawing one section of the spinal cord. The spinal cord have nerves coming in and out of it, uh, represented here in yellow. Here is the right side and left side of the spinal cord, because remember, we are looking at this from the front. So neurons travel into the spinal cord through uh, from the back, uh, from the dorsal part of the spinal cord. Here in yellow is a first order neuron. This first order neuron is a sensory neuron, which brings in information of or, uh, or action potential of a pain, temperature, pressure, etc. The sensory neurons have many receptors on their dendrites. Let's say, for example, this first order neuron is innervating a tissue of our skin. Let's just say it's the right hand, our right hand. Now imagine there is a cut or damage to that area of tissue, the right hand. Immune cells within the area will get activated and further recruit more immune cells, mounting an inflammatory response. Here you have immune cells such as neutrophils, macrophages, and mast cells. All these cells, as well as the damaged skin cells, will release inflammatory mediators. These are things such as prostaglandins, bradykinin, ATP, hydrogen ions, as well as serotonin and histamine, and there are many, many more. All these mediators will stimulate receptors on these sensory nerve fibers. Prostaglandins, for example, will bind onto what's called prostanoid receptors, causing a depolarization of the neuron, thus stimulating, essentially, this first-order neuron. Bradykinin will bind onto what's called a B2 receptor, causing a depolarization as well, and thus, again, stimulating this neuron, stimulating the first-order neuron. And the other mediators will also somehow stimulate the first-order neuron through other mechanisms and other receptors. What's fascinating is that when this first-order neuron is stimulated, it will further promote an, an inflammatory response by releasing other chemicals such as substance P and CGRP. Thus, this inflammatory process is amplified. Because there are many inflammatory mediators being produced, it's important to remember one of them here, which actually plays one of the, one of the main roles in this pain pathway. The one I'm talking about is prostaglandins, specifically prostaglandin E2 and F2. Prostaglandin E2 causes depolarization and, of course, will thus cause an action potential. This action potential will travel all the way to the end, to the back or the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. At the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, the first order neuron will synapse and relay the stimuli to a second neuron. The second order neuron will cross over to the other side from the right to the left and will enter what's called the spinothalamic tract. And you have two spinothalamic tracts, the anterior and the lateral spinothalamic tract. The second order neuron will travel 
up towards the brain, past the brain stem, and terminate at the thalamus. The thalamus is a relay station in the brain. In the thalamus, the second order neuron will synapse with a third neuron called the third order neuron. The third order neuron, which is now stimulated, will carry this action potential uh, stimuli to the somatosensory cortex. And the third order neuron will actually discern which area of the body that information originated from. So here it will be the hand. And so here, the somatosensory area for the right hand, uh, the perception of pain is felt. Interesting point about sensation. Whatever we feel on the right, it's processed on the left side of the brain and vice versa. So let's go to the very beginning where the pain pathway started. Now, because prostaglandins are very important players, important mediators of inflammation and thus pain, let us see how it is made. During periods of trauma or injury, many cells around the area, in this case immune cells and damaged skin cells, will convert their phospholipids, their cell membrane, into arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid, or AA, can be converted to prostaglandin H2. Prostaglandin H2 then becomes prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin F2. These prostaglandins are the ones that, that initiate or cause fever, enhance pain, and inflammation. The enzymes responsible for the production of these are cyclooxygenase 1, COX-1, and cyclooxygenase 2, COX-2. Interestingly, COX-1 and COX-2, despite being of the same name really, are very different. You see, COX-1 is always active to maintain homeostasis in our body. It's a good guy. COX-2 is the one active during injury, stress, and trauma. For example, let's take a look at platelets. When we cut ourselves, we need to stop bleeding. Platelets help with this. What happens here is that COX-1 converts arachidonic acid to prostaglandin H2. Prostaglandin H2, as we have just learned earlier, can then be converted to prostaglandin E2 and F2. However, in platelets, something different happens. Prostaglandin H2 is actually converted to thromboxin A2. Thromboxin A2 is a chemical causing platelet aggregation to help stop bleeding. NSAIDs work by blocking the COX enzyme. They can be broadly divided into non-specific, also known as non-selective NSAIDs, where they block both COX-1 and COX-2, and these drugs include aspirin, ibuprofen, and naproxen, or they can be divided into specific, also known as selective NSAIDs, which block specifically COX-2 enzyme. This is coccyps, such as celecoxib, for example. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, such as your common ibuprofen, are non-selective, and so they block both COX-1 and COX-2. Thus, they are actually antipyretic, analgesic, and anti-inflammatory. Side effects of these drugs mean that they are anticoagulants, so you can bleed easily. You can also be partially allergic, getting a skin rash, and also NSAIDs can induce bronchospasm because some prostaglandins have a role in bronchodilation. Many people take aspirin. Aspirin is unique because they really mainly work by inhibiting COX in platelets, thus preventing formation of thromboxin A2. Thromboxin A2 normally causes platelets to clump together, a process known as platelet aggregation. Thus, aspirin thins the blood, so you can say it reduces clotting. Unfortunately, COX-1, as mentioned earlier, is normally active and maintains homeostasis of the body, particularly in the stomach and in the kidneys. And so inhibiting COX-1 can have some bad effects on these organs. In the stomach, for example, COX-1 converts our arachidonic acid to prostaglandin H2, which then forms prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin I2. 
these prostaglandins actually help decrease acid production in the stomach. And so by inhibiting COX-1 here, you are essentially allowing more acid to be produced in the stomach. So side effects include dyspepsia, nausea and vomiting, gastric ulcers, and hemorrhage are potential long-term high-dose consequences. In the kidney, COX-1 normally converts um, arachidonic acid to prostaglandin H2, which then makes prostaglandin E2 and prostaglandin I2. In the kidney, these prostaglandins help maintain renal blood flow. Therefore, NSAIDs can actually just cause uh, nephritis and kidney injury. NSAIDs are also one of three drugs which make up what's called the triple whammy. Triple whammy is a combination of three drugs you do not want to be on, especially if you have some kidney problem. These three drugs, drugs are diuretics, NSAIDs, and ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin receptor blockers. So we just talked about non-selective or non-specific NSAIDs. Now let's focus on selective or specific NSAIDs. Now selective NSAIDs were created to reduce the side effects of non-selective ones. Another very common drug is paracetamol, or you can know it as uh, Panadol. It's thought to elicit its mechanism of action in a similar way. However, it is unclear actually how it works, but potentially it inhibits an isoform of the COX enzyme. It is a potent analgesic and antipyretic, but has no anti-inflammatory role. Important to note that high doses of paracetamol can lead to liver toxicity. I hope you enjoyed this video on the pharmacology of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Thank you for watching. If you want to know more about the pain pathway, click on the link.